Good evening and welcome to our Vox number seven. I can't believe that we're already halfway through our first ever series of e-speakers, but today's is an absolute blinder of a couple of guests. We have, first of all, at six o'clock, the amazing Mr. Tim Gorman. Uh, Tim is probably the most intelligent scientist I've ever had the pleasure of meeting and is probably, well, I say probably, he is the nicest guy. And then later on for our Vox 8 sessions, we're going to be welcoming the sensationally talented Mr. Alex Archer. So it's going to be over to Tim. Tim used to play in the band when it was known as Emmy Joe a long time ago. And I believe he went on to great things at Cambridge University, getting a PhD, first class honours, and is now the chief mad scientist over at Evotech. And so we're delighted for him to be here today to talk to you. Just a quick reminder for the rules for the session. If you'd like to ask him any questions, I'm sure I'd be more than happy to um, say hi and answer those. So put them in the chat box, still will monitor those. If you can keep your mics on mute, that would be really lovely so that we don't interrupt the flow. And it's gonna be over to Tim. Good evening, Tim. Hello, everybody. And um, you're calling I'm... in from Cambridge, is that right? So I, I now live in Oxbridge. Uh, kind of uh, just below uh, Oxford um, in a little place called Wallingford, which is kind of where they, um, it's near where they have lots of like midsummer murders and these kind of uh, is that things, right? but it's a nice place to end up, yeah. So that's, uh, it is lovely to have you here because you're actually a Duffield boy, really, aren't you? A long time yeah. ago, and if you've got a few minutes and you wouldn't mind saying so, would you give the listeners a bit of a, a potted history on where you came from, what schools, universities, the whole of that, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, I actually uh, was born in Derby, you know, um, not to uh, go through every detail, but um, I went to school uh, in, in Ecclesbourne for my secondary school. Um, and then following that, I had some interest in um, chemistry, but, but mainly music, and I had the great luxury of being involved in Emmy Joe with uh, both Stu and, and John and uh, the gang at that time, which was a fantastic community. So I really wanted to do uh, music, um, but actually it didn't really work out for me in the audition process. Um, I probably wasn't um, musically mature enough. I certainly was a little bit naive about the audition process. And um, it wasn't really right for me to, to go to music school, I think, in retrospect. But what I did was I switched my application from, um, from, from music to chemistry in the end. I went through the simple process of opening the UCAS book. Um, if they still have paper copies of those things now. Uh, and I went from A to Z and I stopped at C for chemistry. I said, chemistry is quite fun at school. I'll do chemistry. So I went to Emmy Joe. Um, I went to school at Ecclesbourne. And then I went to York, first of all, for undergrad. And on day one of uh, York, I found the, the jazz band. <laughs> and I signed up and they said, very nice, you can have an audition. I did the audition and they said, yeah, you're in. You can have a uh, first seat or whatever. And they said, see your practices on Monday. But that was a problem because um, Monday was also the chemistry labs. And I made the choice that um, because I was there to do a degree in chemistry, I would stick to that. And that stopped me from staying involved in music at York um, when I look back at that now. So I, I actually didn't do very much music for a long period of time. Um, I carried on with chemistry wholeheartedly. And that was probably something I did well, get really involved. And I did summer um, research placements every year at York. And then um, with different professors. And I also went around, so I went to Imperial for one summer. Um, and I got a research placement at AZ. So I did my master's year at AstraZeneca. Um, and then I went to Cambridge because I'd kind of climbed a bit of a ladder. Uh, and near the top of my year. So I got into Cambridge to do my PhD and I finished that and I went to Oxford to do a postdoc, um, still in um, the same kind of research. So this will be in looking at um, organic synthesis. So that's uh, making 
um, molecules in an intelligent way for a, for a purpose. And then we um, apply those techniques and publish them and communicate what, what we've discovered. So it's cutting edge you know, uh, research and hopefully if people in the pharmaceutical industry, people in agrochemicals can apply those new techniques um, to benefit them being able to make the molecules they want to make. So we're inventing the ways and they're using them to make the molecules they want to make. And then uh, that kind of experience led me to get a job at uh, a pharmaceutical company. So I now work at Evotech, um, which is uh, based in kind of Didcot area. And uh, hopefully I'm going to uh, cure many diseases and win various prizes and stuff there. But <laughs> at the moment, that's, uh, that's how it's going. So what, what, can you just go through again what you actually do for the layman? Because there's some people here who are definitely not scientists or into medicine in the same way. What, what is your job now you know, at Evotech? So you just go through it in very simple language for us. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I turn up to work and I have a list of molecules that I'm trying to make. Um, and the way that I would look to do that is I will, using a, you know, specific websites and my own knowledge, I can design a route to make these molecules, which is like a series of recipes. Um, and I'll order the chemicals and I'll do it myself you know, mix the chemicals in a, in a glass flask. Um, and then I will use various uh, techniques to prove that I've made what I wanted to make. And then I'll send them probably to Germany or to a facility to test them and see whether they have an effect. So I'm trying to work on a specific type of cancer. So what I would do is we would have, um, in, in the simple case, tests you know, um, to say, is this molecule having an effect? And if it's not, then there might be reasons we could suppose. Uh, then we'd make another molecule. So what we have is design, make, test yeah. cycle. And so we would, uh, in a kind of uh, simple terms, we would be following that round and we would learn our lessons from each test we did, hopefully. Um, and then we would repeat and we would go back to the fume hood and see what the next molecule that makes sense to make. So, so it, there's a question. It's very like practice makes perfect. You, you know, the same sort of ethos. You keep doing the same, you know, you're trying new routines, trying new formulas to gradually fi hone down onto your answer. Is that? Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. So, so there's an example I can use from like today. So um, we wanted, um, maybe the route that I'm following is like five steps. That's, that's not unusual, it's not good, it's not bad. But there might be a difficult step at the start. And so I would start on a small scale and I would try a couple of different ways to make it. Or um, maybe if the difficulty is later on, then I could make a big batch of uh, one of the intermediates and then I could um, trial a couple of different ways to make it. And so if I'm lucky, they're pretty established. and the kind of um, ex resulting literature is, is pretty close and maybe it's, maybe it's not, so maybe I have to be more creative and, um, and it takes longer. So there's an idea that if you make the right molecule, it's worth spending time on. So there's a question like how long would it take to make a molecule from my list? It, it could be uh, as simple as a day if I had good intermediates that were close to what I want, good building blocks. It could be uh, I, you know, months, because if it's worth it to get the answer, then it's, it's worth it. Yeah, and what, what happens now, well, you know, once you've finished this and it's gone off to testing, how does that then get to market? You know, what are the chat? is it licensed, patented? You know, what happens? Does your company do that as well? So I, um, this is a cool thing to be able to say, something that I had an input in the design of uh, was included in the patent. So that's not uh, unusual. Lots of things are covered by patents. As you can imagine, it's um, intensely valuable intellectual property. So then um, the steps following just making a molecule would be like, it has to have favorable results in the test. 
and we would give uh, we would make more so that we could uh, test it in increasingly complex ways. So in the first way, it would just be um, an isolated uh, protein, and then it might we te might test it in the context of a cell, but the cell's not in a living organism, and then we would test it maybe in a in an organism, you know, a, a mouse, or increasingly complicated. Um, so actually, like an angelfish, are like really, for some weird reason, a good a good way to test something, and then you go into an increasingly complex situations. And you'd learn more about the molecule along the way and be sure it's not going to do bad stuff because you want to fail fast um, so that you avoid spending more money. The, the later tests are the more complicated ones. So along the way, you patent, right? Um, you protect the intellectual property so that no competitors get in the way. You also work out how there's no safety problems. So for using uh, a, contact, uh, a relevant example in the COVID systems, we want vaccines and we want medication for COVID. So we need to balance the time it will take to bring a molecule to market against any risks. So it's worth taking the time with some of those um, safety assessments um, and you need the time for any problems to bear out. I think it's incredible. And you must have had some you know, moments where you thought this is really what I enjoy doing, which is what's motivated you. Um, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of our kids who might be going into the same position as what you were back when you were 17 and 18. You know, we've got children who are off to university, except, you know, university might not exist in the same way for the next six months. You know, they might be just doing online lessons. So that ability to pivot, you know, you managed to go from music and go quite successfully into chemistry and do so, so well. Are there any other life lessons or things that you've picked up which you think are worth sharing or just for people to be yeah. aware of? Like, I had a bit of a think about this. Uh, it's a, a pet theory of mine that um, patterns are extremely important in music. And I don't just mean like a motif that you'll repeat and modulate through, through a solo, but I mean like um, you recognize a sound and you can uh, translate it. Um, I think patterns are extremely important in science. You see something happening again and you infer that it's you know, the going thing, that's like how we work out physical laws and chemistry laws. So to dial that down a bit, I think that it's really important to scientists to have an analytical mindset, but I don't think you necessarily start out with that. It, it's more refined as you learn what to be maybe cynical or what to be curious about. So there's a balance between cynicism and, and curiosity. Do so you have to learn the right way? So um, I will just bring out a few of these points. I think that in music, this is maybe the tenuous side, like music's maybe experimental. You, you, you John Coltrane tries some like uh, crazy pentatonic stuff in some solo, and a chemist might try one of the uh, less ex exemplified ideas from the literature to try and make their compound. And that's a very chemistry relevant thing. In, in music, you have something that's productive. You produce an album, you produce recordings, you produce a body of work that you're familiar with in terms of learning the standards or learning some repertoire. You, you also engage in teaching. So you have communication, you have productivity in music. In, in chemistry and in science generally, you're productive materially. You might make you know, a compound, but you might also uh, produce a body of work that's for publication. That's a bit like a recording in a way that you have a, a paper. So something I'm really proud of is, is, is my publications and when they get cited. You also communicate in, in conferences and you communicate the data that you find out in, in meetings just with your colleagues. So communication's central for music. Yeah. Um, you know, you communicate your ideas um, at the bandstand, maybe. Um, so I think that the public performance aspect really helped me throughout in, in communication and in uh, the confidence to speak, you know? Um, so yeah, experimental music um, and cutting edge research, there's kind of a, a, an analogy there to be made. Arts are extremely beneficial to the uh, community Science can be societally beneficial um, 
it's materially relevant that, you know, COVID is something that we need to overcome and find ways around. But also things like, you know, learning new ways to break down plastics to reduce their impact uh, or process recycling, process waste, or uh, make, you know, better solar panels for storing sunlight energy, you know. Um, another thing, I asked some of my colleagues what they thought some of the great things about working in research were. Uh, so this is from a sample of chemists. So um, one thing we all agreed is actually chemists are, are quite sociable folk. You have to work collaboratively in the lab. Um, you share ideas to help you make um, best use of your time. You don't want to fall into the same pitfalls other people might do. And so as part of that, also with the, the lab work and the office work, it, it's chemistry at the lab and lots of research jobs in this way don't feel like office jobs in the way that a musician might think, I don't want to work in an office, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you have that balance. Um, it, th there's a varied work, and I think that, that happens in music too. So, so maybe chemistry isn't you know, your nine to five job. Um, it's a little bit vocational. People really get stuck into chemistry um, and people really get stuck into music. Um, and I think that's great to meet those people as well. Did you, when you were going through your, I'm thinking about some children who might get very nervous at their auditions or, you know, they're going through their year three exams and they don't know where they're going to go next. What were the specific challenges from, from your perspective of going from you know, York through to your first business placement through to Evotech where you are now? Were, was there anything that really posed a significant challenge that you had to overcome? I think... Uh... The business of working with other people is key. When you move from MEJ 2 to MEJ 1, you know, you're in a band with some of the same people, some different people, maybe some similar characters as well. Maybe there's a new dominant character who you have to, um, you know, deal well with. Um, and I think that that's always a challenge that's very important to address how you interact with these new people. I moved from York to um, some different labs when I was at York. I moved to Cambridge and Oxford, and each time you you want to fit in, and that doesn't mean um, to completely bend over double to do whatever these new people want you to, but to bring your own ideas as smoothly in, and to gain from other people's experience and ideas, and to fit in in an amiable way. You know, to really have some fun with these new guys. Yeah. It sounds to me that that's actually possibly one of the most important life schools that there possibly can be. You've got it, you nailed it on the head. To have the confidence to know that you're bringing something to the table and that, you know, you're wanting to introduce this information in a way that's accepted and welcomed so that you can all work together and improve the team. And, you know, I think that's the dream. Everyone's going to hate you if you come in and say, I'm better than you, blah, 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 right? Cristiano Ronaldo can go to, a, to Real Madrid and say, I'm pretty good. But if Luka Modric looks over and says, I'm pretty good too, then they might put heads. But if he says, OK, I'm coming to a new team, I'm, I'm going to learn from you, and hopefully you can learn some things from me too, then you've got to, you've got to make friends. Yeah, really good. And so, interestingly, though, you've, you've been at Eva Tech for a couple of years and you said that, you know, you don't tend to stay and you like being published and, you know, your publications you're particularly proud of. How, where do you see yourself in the next five, ten years? Have you um, have so, got here? Yeah, this is a good question because um, the one thing that I wanted to like, write down, maybe if I have one message at all, um, is that you can move around to advance and take opportunities. And I strongly advocate that. I think it was a bit of a step up for me to move from, from York to, to Cambridge and maybe to maintain that level in a different bubble at Oxford. I don't think necessarily moving to Evertech was a step up in the same way, but it's a different group of people and a different challenge. Um, so you can move around for sure to take opportunities, but one thing that I haven't been brilliant at is actually to, to keep in touch with people in the previous systems. 
um, and to benefit from those acquaintances and, and colleagues and friends, importantly, that you've built up there. And to, to build that network actually is really invaluable. I want to stay at Evotech and I want to do well there and I want to, um, uh, I think the word is like, stabilize maybe, you know, to, to, to benefit from staying somewhere for a while. And um, that stability I think can bring a kind of comfort that you're not looking for the next thing. Yeah, I think it's fab, Tim. Honestly, I could talk all day, but we have got some great questions coming in. If it's okay, I yeah. can share them. Now, you said that you didn't do much music at York. In fact, one of our uh, directors actually went to York to do music, and he was in the Monday Night Band and would have met you if you'd have um, made it there. Yeah. But um, a lot of them are interested. In, are you still doing any music today? Have you picked it back up again? So I have. I have. Um, and... Uh, about um, when I moved from um, when I moved to Oxford I knew that I wanted to after like the heavy hours of the PhD uh, and to some extent heavy hours in the postdoc so that's like um, you're working uh, in the PhD in a self-employed way but it's kind of a crazy way as well so I was working like uh, eight till uh, ten like um, Monday to Friday at least and then um, also uh, all of Saturday um, and doing bits on Sundays it's, it, it was quite intense in that way um, and that was kind of expected and um, it's part of the you know the agreement you make the kind of fast impact for the PhD but um, I didn't make time for music I mean like that's a no excuses I didn't make time for it I did always enjoy listening and then when I got to York, uh, to Oxford, and then especially when I got my own house, um, so with my wife, um, uh, who is still the same person uh, <laughs> I was going with that image of, um, yeah. I um, have moved in somewhere and we've got the space to practice and not annoy neighbours so much. So I've been playing for like a, a year and a half now. Wow. Um, kind of uh, started back in, in 2019 in January kind of time. Um, and uh, so I've been a weekend warrior playing on my own. So I, I hope with my new uh, reacquaintance with John, I can ask for some help. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I want to get more involved in playing with other people as well. I mean, like uh, you learn from uh, the kind of lockdown period as well, uh, how important social interactions are and uh, to play with other people would be really nice. Yeah. I've been waiting till I feel better, but I think I'll be waiting forever until I feel better. So. <laughs> and the rest of us, and the rest of us. So um, before we start getting towards the end of the session, just some happy memories of times that um, we shared together, Tim, because it's always, uh, I love to do this at the end of a session. I was having a chat with Jane about um, our favourite memory of Tim in band, and she literally said, well, actually, it was when he was eight weeks old at the NCT um, mummies and babies class and he was dribbling into a tea towel that had been tied around his neck because his mum had left a bib at home so um, you know there, we've, we've got so many and you know you were the nicest kindest guy in band and you know the fact that everybody called you Gooman for some reason I don't even remember why but, you know I just have happy memories have you got anything that you know sticks out that you could share I, I think um we did a range of things. It, I was only in the band. I, I kind of worked out it's maybe like three and a half, four years or so. But it felt like we had uh, so many memories and so much fun playing. There may be like a, one really proud moment. One, like my first solo in MEJ2. And I like did a, a trading, trading fours with Alec Lomas. Yes. Uh, murdering some uh, blues in Go Daddy O, I think. Um, but uh, all the way through to you know, playing, uh, when John let me play there for as like an alto feature thing. Oh, that was cool. And that was incredible for me. Like the honor of that was um, mad. Um, and John looked mad at me when I missed an entrance <laughs> when I played. The band. So, uh, you know, um, there was uh, a great amount of support to try these things to kind of uh, be allowed to fail as I often did, but to, uh, you know, get back next week and, and try again. 
the the fun we had and the good humor throughout uh was fantastic yeah um, and you know the guy's incredible so yeah no, we love it. And, you know, it's been wonderful. In fact, just before I do finish off, there's a message from one of our directors, non-execs. He says, and whether this is true or not, scientists have recently discovered that humans give off a collective chemical signature depending on the emotions of the group. If that's the case, what would the chemical signature be of a, of a band? What would it give it off? Is that true? Oh, I, I, I've not, I've not um, experienced that, but it would have to be like, um, let's go for dopamine, right? Like something <laughs> yeah. that's like, you're happy. That's amazing. Thanks, Tim. And, you know, I'm sure if anybody wants to drop you a message about maybe how they get into chemistry or the good publications yeah. to read, I can share your, or they can get those details to me and I'll forward them on. Is that okay? Absolutely. I was thinking like um, maybe I've some um, experience of of the Oxbridge thing, but not yeah. not applying the undergrad. But I could try and, and help um, definitely with chemistry um, and uh, the kind of interview type things. But honestly, I'd be happy to try and help with with any of these things. Um, and uh, even yeah, how, however I can help, I'll I'll try and help you. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, in that case, thank you very much, Mr. Gorman. It's been an absolute pleasure. People do send him a message and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the next session, Vox 8, where we have a quick chat with the wonderfully talented Mr. Alexander Archer. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.